serve a God who is indescribable. Amen. Let's sing from the highest. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature. Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God All powerful All powerful, untainable All struck we fall to our knees
Please be seated for a minute. Uh, welcome. Uh, those of you who are here at Mariners this morning and those who are listening on live stream, I'm just telling you, if you're listening on live stream, you're missing some big time worship right here. Amen? Oh, man. Yeah, that's what I say. Um, well, it's great to be here, and I am wearing my, my victory socks again, yeah? But that's good. That's good. But let me tell you why we're here on Sunday mornings. I'll tell you, we are here on Sunday mornings because 2 Timothy 3.16 says all Scripture is inspired by God. Folks, you realize that God wrote a book, and we are going to hear the voice of God speaking a message to us about the heart of God this morning that you're not going to want to miss. So dial in this morning, and I'm going to have you stand. I had you sit down for a moment, but please stand back up. We're going to read God's Word and hear God speak, the mouth of the Lord Jesus. In Luke, 11, <clears throat> verse, uh, Luke 15, verse 11 through 24, it says, and, and he said, Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. 
and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were, were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, and I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up, and I'll go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And so he got up, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you for the word of God that you've inspired, that that this is truth, Lord. This is reality that we're reading about, reality concerning you, concerning your heart. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us today uniquely. Lord, help us to hear the message that you have for us and that we would respond, Lord, with faith and obedience. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Please be seated. So in Luke chapter 15, we're looking at the third of three stories, three parables that the Lord tells here. The first one is about a shepherd who lost a sheep. The second tells about a woman who lost a coin and found it. The third is about a loving father and two sons. It's familiarly known to us as the story of the prodigal son, but it has so much more in it. This whole chapter is the story about the joy of God. And in the first story, the shepherd who lost one of his sheep finds it and brings it back and has a party and calls everyone to rejoice. And it says in verse 7, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous who need no repentance. And in the second story, the woman finds her lost coin and she calls her friends together to rejoice. And it says in the same way, there is joy in the presence of the angels when just one sinner repents. Heaven's joy, folks, is based on repenting sinners. Any sinner who repents brings joy to God and all those around God, the angels. Now, this this third story is the story of a son. He's, first of all, a prodigal son, a a wasteful son who, who came back home to his father and consequently brought him great joy, profound, uh, exuberant joy that caused a celebration. Heaven, heaven's joy is, is continually over repenting sinners. The, the joy of God is found in the recovery of the lost, as we read in verse 7 and 10. And we see it so dramatically in this third story, which ends with a massive celebration over a lost son who has come home. Now, last week, we looked at the story from the perspective of the younger son. And we learned from him the nature of true repentance. We share with you how the the story breaks down into four movements. The first is he's home and he's disconnected. The second, he's away and living large. The third movement is that he's broke and miserable. And finally, we see him awakened and repentant. Well, uh, the young boy was at home, and, and it was obviously he was disconnected from his family. He had no love for his father. He had uh, no, no love for his brother. And he asks for his share of the inheritance was essentially he was, you know, basically wanting his dad to die. And surprisingly, the father gives to him what he wants. And in short order, the the boy leaves and he goes to a far country and he's away and living large. He's, man, he's living it up. He's the party boy that just come to town, 
all the people are coming to him because he's got all the money. Well, it's not long before his money runs out. And at the same time, a severe famine occurs in that country, and he becomes broke and miserable. He has too much pride to return home, so he decides his option is to to get a job, and he gets a poor paying job, a job feeding swine, and he ends up, uh, all he has is the opportunity to eat the food the swine are eating in the pig slop, and we see him just, just as low as you can go, competing with the pigs for his food. But this is where the story just turns. As we said last week, he gives us the purest picture of repentance. He is, he is awakened and repentant. What, what is repentance? It, there are four things required for true repentance, four must. And the first thing is, is repentance must have a reveille. There must be an awakening. You know, there must be a bugle that blows at your life that wakens you out of the slumber. And that's what the Holy Spirit did in the life of this young man. He blew a bugle called desperation, and he woke this young man up from his spiritual slumber. And he's awakened for a second thing that is necessary for true repentance, and that is a realization. Uh, He came to realize when he woke, when he came to his senses, that how many of my, my father's hired men have more than enough bread, and I'm sitting here dying in this in this place with hunger. He he comes to the realization that it's better for it would be better for me to be at my father's house than where sin has led me here. The third thing that repentance must have, a reveille, a realization, it must have a resolve. Uh, There must be a decision that's made. And he made a decision. He said, I will, there's an act of his will, I will get up and I will go to my father. But it's not yet repentance because repentance also has a recognition. He, He says, I will get up And I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. A person who is truly repentant realizes that he is unworthy, that he deserves nothing, and he must recognize that that the father owes him nothing. And so repentance is a Reveille, a realization, a resolve, and a recognition of unworthiness, but it's not repentance until you get to this final must, and that is a return. It says, it experience, the repentance really begins to happen in verse 20 when it says, he got up and he came to his father. True repentance produces action. It must touch the body. If If I'm an alcoholic and I repent, I must get my body up and leave the bar. Do you understand? Repentance is a road. It is a journey that that I must get up and come home on the journey, the road of repentance. So that's what true repentance is. This, This son had it. What happens? Here's the question today. What happens when I am truly repentant? What does the Father in heaven do when a sinner repents? That's the question. And today we're going to pick up the story from where we left off last week. The the prodigal son is now walking down the road of repentance. Uh, He's headed home. And the focus today is on the second character in this story, the father And folks, the father in this story gives us the clearest picture of grace as anywhere in the scripture. Grace. And I want you to see five things this morning that grace does. Five actions of grace. And here's the first thing. Grace loves. Verse 11 and 12 again. And he said, a man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he, the father, divided his wealth between them, between the two boys. Now listen, folks, grace understands the nature of true love. It it is not love if it's forced. Grace does not force its beloved to love. Grace will we'll, we'll 
let the beloved one go. And that's exactly what the father did. He could, the father could have forcibly tried to keep him to stay. He, he could have tried to persuade him to stay, but he would not do it. Love, real love, listen to me now, is willing to be rejected. He was willing to have his love rejected and to let his son leave. This, I believe this father is perhaps the clearest expression of 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, that great passage on love. When you read it, it's like reading a profile on this father. Let me give it to you from the message paraphrase. It says this, love never gives up. That's what this father was like. Love cares more about others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Listen to this. Love doesn't force itself on others. It is, isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score with the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of the truth. Puts up with anything. Trusts God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back. Keeps on going to the end. I, that's a description of this father uh, that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. And so the father loves. That's the first action. He gives to him. He's willing to, to lose him and let him go. He takes every, and so the son takes everything he's got. And we see what happens in, in verses 13 through 16. He's, he's away. He's living large. Then he becomes broke. He's miserable. And finally, we get to verses 17 and 20. And he's awakened and repentant. Let's pick up the story again. Let me read these verses again to you. In verse 17, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And so he got up and came to his father. He's, he's reached this place of true repentance. He's now walking on the path back to his father's house. And, and every step of the way, he's, he's memorizing and practicing this, this speech that he's prepared to give to his father. And now let, let, let's see what we can learn about grace from his father's life here in the rest of the story. Grace loves first. Here's the second thing that grace does. Grace looks. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Now, understand, all the rabbis taught that repentance was work that a man does to, to earn God's favor when he feels sorry for his sin. That's, that's what repentance was to the Jew. You feel sorry for your sin, you want to be restored to God, and so you do work and by that work, you gain favor with God by making restitution. That's what the prodigal thought. But he is about to receive the shock of his life. Pro probably everyone in the village thought that if that boy ever came home, he'd probably have to work 99 years to win his way back into favor with his dad, to be able to sit at the table again. But that's not what happened. What happened while he was still a long way off, it says, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. The father, folks, was looking every day. Grace looks down the path from which the loved one might return. Grace never gives up hope on the one that it loves. Now, the father would have known the kind of life that the son was going off to live uh, would end up probably the way it ended up, and, but he hoped he would survive that, that life and hoped that he would come back home. And so the father is, is bearing this, this private pain, this suffering love all alone in his heart, and every day he's looking at that road. He's looking down that path hoping his son will come home. He looks and he looks and he looks. He gets up another day and he looks again. And then one day, all of a sudden, there's a guy walking down there, and boy, his walk looks familiar. It's him. It's, it's, it's my son. 
And it says that he felt compassion for him as he came into clear view. Compassion for his, not just his past sin, but for his present filth. He was, he could see he's in rags. He, he looks like a pig. The word compassion there comes from a root that means your intestines, your bowels. He, he felt this intense feeling for his son. He was hurting in his stomach for the condition of the boy. But, but grace looks with hope for that one that it loved. And I was wondering, as I was preparing this this week, how many people might be here today or how many people listening in the sound of my voice that the Father is looking for you to come down that road of repentance and you have not come yet. But grace loves, grace looks, and here's the third thing, grace launches. When grace sees repentance, it launches into a full-on sprint toward the repentance. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him because he was looking, and he felt compassion for him, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. It says that he ran. In that culture, Middle Eastern noblemen didn't run. And, and the word running here literally says, and running. It is a Greek word, a technical word, which was used for racing in a stadium, in a contest. It means that he sprinted. This father sprinted to his son. It wasn't a trot. It wasn't a shuffle. It was an all-out sprint. He couldn't get there fast enough. Do you understand? And, and this is beneath his dignity. Of, of a Middle Eastern nobleman. He would have to, nobody, they didn't like to show their legs. He would have to lift his robe up to run and to sprint. He empties himself of any pride, any rights, any honor. It's a self-emptying display of love. He brings shame to himself in order to throw, throw his arms around this returning repentant sinner to, to protect him from being shamed by anyone else. No doubt the people in the village would have thought, there he comes, that it would have had a low opinion of his son, and so he sprints. And if that's not enough, he runs, he embraces him, he kisses him repeatedly on his head, on his cheek, on his lips, amazing. Folks, how eager is God to receive a sinner? He will run through dirt, he will bear the shame, he will embrace the sinner with all his strength and plant kisses on the sinner's head. Folks, God runs. To the repentant. You know, some people think our God is a, a reluctant Savior. <laughs> no, He is not. The kiss of affection is repeated and repeated. The, the prodigal son is ready to kiss the father's feet, and the father kisses him on the head. This is a gesture in that culture of acceptance, friendship, love, forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, all of it. All of that before the, before the son says one word. What does he have to say to the father? He's there. That is enough for the father to indicate his faith in the father and his repentance. Coming home, he knew that he would have to cast himself upon the mercy of the father. And he comes knowing that he had to be ready to bear the shame. And he came. The forgiving father's reaction to the sinning son was shocking to the listeners, to these Pharisees that were listening. It was unexpected. It was a huge surprise. The father condescends. He humbles himself out of this deep love for his son. He comes all the way down from his house to the dirt of the village. He runs through, bearing the scorn, the shame. He throws his arms around a penitent, believing sinner, who is coming to him in his filth and unclean rags. Folks, this father is doing exactly what Jesus did for us. This is what Jesus did. I'm reminded of Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, where it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he was noble <laughs> He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself of all of his pride, Jesus did. And, and taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Je Folks, Jesus came into our village 
ran the gauntlets to bear the shame and the slander, the mockery, to throw his arms around us and kiss us. And now, listen, the shock of this is that all of this happened. The father did this for the son without any what? Without any works. That's the shock. It was, it was all grace, as the next verse makes clear. Grace loves, grace looks, grace launches into a sprint. And here's the, here's the fourth thing. Grace limits. After the father breaks away from kissing the son, he finally has enough space to give his well-prepared speech. And it was a legal speech. He's about to set forth the terms that he has to win back his, his father's favor. He had it all planned out in his mind. Father, I'll be like one of your hired men, and I'll work for 10 years, and maybe, you know, I can come into the house at that point, and I'll work, you know, all of that. It says in verse 21, he said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And after grace, here's the beginning of what it knows to be a legal speech. It sets up a limit, a stop sign. Grace hears him talking about a works kind of righteousness, and it says, absolutely not. Grace says, no, that's enough, son. We're done with that. You, you are limited from trying to earn my favor by becoming my servant and being one of my hired hands. You, listen to this. You don't have to earn your way into my favor. You you have it right now. Grace loves, grace looks, grace launches, grace limits law speech. Grace does not listen to law. The, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Bam, end of speech. He doesn't even give him time to get to the part, make me as one of your hired men. Why? Why? The father interrupts him is because there's no need for works. He's just received grace. This is the jolt in the story. The father is so eager he receives, embraces, reconciles with the son before the son can say anything. All the sinner has to do, all any of us have to do is to come penitently, come with true repentance, trusting in God. And the Savior runs to the sinner, asking nothing, throwing his arms of love, mercy, and grace around the sinner, kissing him repeatedly. Because that's the joy of God. That's what gives God joy. So don't you see, the son starts out, and so do the listeners, with sort of a Jewish understanding of repentance and faith and works. And the son ends up, and so do we with a divine understanding of repentance, of faith, and grace. The son was ready to suffer. He feels, well, it would be right for me to suffer, but it's not necessary. It doesn't belong. The father does not allow the son to offer a plan. We're working for acceptance. There, there is no plan. That would be an insult to grace, an insult to love, to the shame that the father bore. The son has just seen grace in its fullness, and so have we. He knows now he is accepted with full love, accepted as a son. No conversation about being a hired hand. He will gladly become a son, and wouldn't you, to this loving, forgiving father and leave his future in his father's hands. Which leads us to the final aspect of grace, final action of grace, Grace loves, grace looks, grace launches, grace limits, and grace, listen to this, folks, grace lavishes. Verse 22, but the father, after cutting him off, said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Listen, folks, grace is more than not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. See, the first side of grace is, is that, that you, get what, you don't get what you deserve. You, you, you do not need to work in order to be forgiven. Grace totally removes all the liabilities from the sinner's life. 
All the debts, folks, are removed. You cannot remove them by your good works. They've already been removed by the Lord Jesus on the cross. The only reason that we can experience this amazing grace is that Jesus in his own person absorbed all of the debt that we owe to God for our sins. Listen to Colossians 2.14. It says this, Jesus canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Every time you sin, it's a decree of God to suffer eternal punishment. Jesus canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Alex reminded me this week of that great hymn that says, My sin, O the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Grace does what works could never do. It wipes out the debt. We've said it so many times here. Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. In this story, the father absorbed in himself all the debts the son owed. But there are two sides to grace. The, the, the father does more than absorb the debts. The father, listen to me, multiplies the assets to the prodigal son. He erases the liabilities and expands the assets. Grace lavishes. Grace lavishes love on the beloved. See what he says here. Quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put on a, a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, let's celebrate. What is he doing here? He is lavishing the son with all of the rights and the privileges of sonship. He's taking off the old rags of his life of sin and he puts on him the best robe. That he puts a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, kills the fattened calf. Now, folks, look at this robe. I understand when he's talking here about the best robe, he's talking about the robe that belonged to himself. It belonged to the father. It was the robe that belonged to the, the most prominent member of the family to be worn at the most prominent setting and celebration event. The father is about to call for the greatest celebration that has ever occurred in this family, in this village, and he's giving away the garment that he would normally wear. It, it was his way of saying to this son, son, everything I have is yours. <laughs> It was a token of saying, the best that I have is yours. The best of everything I have is yours. It's all symbolized in that robe. And it's even more than that. You now are fully restored as a son. It's, it's as though the king passes his robe on to the prince, another self-emptying act of the father, clothing him with his glorious garment. He came in stinking, wearing rags, unclean. Nobody would ever see him that way again. That's the picture. He came with nothing. He didn't have a suitcase. He came in his own stinking clothes. He was barely able to arrive. He had nothing. That's how a sinner comes. But what does God do? Well, listen to this, folks. What does God do for the sinner who realizes that there is nothing he can do to earn God's favor? Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Listen to it. But to the one who does not work, the one who knows he can't work for God's favor, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Let me tell you what God gives to the repentant sinner. He gives this gift called justification. And I'm going to give you a theological definition of justification because this is exactly what this son received when he re returned home to his father. Justification is God's pronouncement as judge that a person is free from punishment, due for his wrongdoing, declared not guilty. Res then, then, as this son was, restored to favor and a covenant relationship with God, and given all the privileges of one who has kept the law perfectly. This, this son was justified, and that's exactly what the prodigal son received when he came home in repentant faith, the, this new robe of righteousness. And the father gave him a ring. He put a ring on his hand 
everyone would understand what that meant. It it would have been mind-boggling because it was a, a signet ring, a ring that had the family crest that they would depress into wax, melted wax on a document. It was authentication that the person wearing that ring had authority, that he had kingdom authority, family authority, and that's what we have as believers. Sandals on his feet. Hired men didn't wear sandals. They went barefoot. He, he, he gave him shoes. He was giving him the full honor of sonship, separating him from the hired men, giving him the honor of putting on the robe, the rings, and the sandals. And then this, the fattened calf. He, this father calls for the party to, to end all parties. He says, bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let's eat and celebrate. My son was dead. He's come to life again. He was lost and now has been found. And they began to celebrate. Every noble family that had animals had one that they set aside a special calf that they would fatten for some great event, some great occasion, a wedding, a a monumental, massive mega feast, and this was it. This was the biggest thing that had happened in the history of that family, happened in the history of that village from the perspective of the father. This was it. And what we have here, folks, is is a picture of heaven rejoicing when one sinner comes home. And I had this thought this morning. I thought, when, because, you know, time, there's no time, it's eternity. When we go home to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus as repentant sinners who have received his grace, will they not throw a party just for us in this same way? Is that amazing to think about? That, that we would be like this. Anyway, I've been, I've been thinking and wondering in the light of this amazing reality and truth concerning the heart of God. Um, I, just, I just would ask you this morning, anybody here at Mariners or those who are listening to my voice, uh, there may be some that have never come home, and I would ask you, what is preventing you What is preventing you from coming home to one who is so filled with mercy and grace that he longs to give them both to you? Jenny grew up in a cherry orchard near Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents were a little old-fashioned and tend to overreact to her nose ring, her music, and the way she dressed. One night, in an argument with her father, she screamed, I hate you. I never want to see you again. And that night, she ran away catching a bus to Detroit. The second day in Detroit, she met a man with the biggest car she'd ever seen, and he offered a ride to her, bought her lunch, and gave her a place to stay. He even gave her some pills that made her feel better than she'd ever felt in her life. The good life continued for about a year. That man she now called boss taught her a few things that men like, and since she was underage, Men would pay a premium for her. She lived in a penthouse, ordered room service whenever she wanted. But after a year, she became ill. And her boss became mean. And soon she was out on the streets without a penny to her name. A little bit of money she made turning tricks all went to support her habit. One freezing night on the streets, sleepless and hungry, Jenny was overwhelmed with a longing to go back home to the cherry orchards, to the warm home, her golden retriever. Sobbing, she called home three times only to get the answering machine. The third time she said, Mom, Dad, it's me. I want to come home. I'm catching the bus, and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow night at the station. If you're not there, I guess I'll just stay on the bus and go to Canada. On the seven-hour bus trip home, Jenny began to have doubts. What will I say? What will they think? Will they even show up? Will Will they even be there at the station? When the bus finally rolled into the small station, the driver announced, 15 minutes, folks. That's all the time we have here, 15 minutes. 15 minutes to decide her life. She nervously checked on how she looked in a little compact mirror. And as she walked into the terminal, nothing could have prepared her for what she saw. Forty people at midnight 
standing there, uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, sisters, mom and dad, grandparents, all in silly party hats, blowing silly noisemakers, holding a banner, a big banner that stretched the entire terminal. Welcome home. As her eyes filled with tears, her dad lunged forward out of the crowd and grabbed her. She said, oh, daddy, I'm so sorry. And her dad said, shh, we don't have time for, for apologies. You're going to be late for the party. We planned a banquet for you at home. Who's Jesus? That's who Jesus is. He's the one who's waiting. He's looking down the road. He's looking and he has nothing for you but mercy and grace. He wants to, to throw a party for you so that he can shower you with so much love that you will grow to love him more than you love yourself. He wants to conquer your heart with love. To be conquered by his love, folks, is to experience eternal life. Eternal life is this. It is loving Jesus more than you love yourself. It is desiring his will more than you desire your own. And what does it take to connect with the grace of the Lord Jesus? It is, it is a decision, like the prodigal, like Jenny, to go home, to walk home. And it goes something like this, Jesus, I want you and me more than, than I want just me. I need your mercy. I long for your grace. I want you to make a difference in my life. I want to live with you and for you. We're going to close this message with a prayer. And I'm going to pray a prayer that I prayed many years ago when I crossed that line into repentance spiritually, when I said something like, God, I, I know about you, I know you exist, but I just don't know you, and I want to know you. I prayed this prayer, and it, it changed my life, and I'm going to invite, if you've never prayed it before, uh, to, to pray with me. And as I pray this prayer, if you've never prayed it, but you agree. Just, just say in your heart yes to what Bill is saying. So would you bow your heads with me? And first I want to I pray for you and then you can follow me in prayer. Father, there are people perhaps here in this service, in this room, who have never begun a relationship with you. People who are listening on live stream who never really have begun a relationship with you. They know about you. They know you exist. But they, they haven't gotten to know you personally. And so today I'm asking, I'm praying that you would give them the courage, Lord, the, the light to repent and to give their lives to you. And now you pray. If this prayer represents your heart, just agree. Dear Jesus, I want you to make a difference in my life. I don't want to stay the same. There, there are things in my life that I know need changing. I, I thank you for showing me today through this message that you love me. I thank you that you stand at the door of eternal life filled with grace. I thank you, Lord, for the incredible price that you paid on the cross so that you could give me mercy and grace. Thank you for dying for my sins, for all those times when I loved myself more than you and more than others. Lord, I, I'm, I'm coming home to you, and I'm understanding that I need mercy and grace. Thank you for being willing not to give me what I deserve, an eternal hell of separation from you, that you bore that on the cross. But, but that you're willing to give me a place that I don't deserve, an eternal heaven with you. Lord, I don't understand it all. But I just thank you. And 
And I open my life up to your love and your grace, your power to change me. I want to get to know you. I invite you to come in and be the Lord. I repent of my sin. I want you to be the Lord of my life from this day forward. And Lord, just start making the changes you want to make in my life as I read your word. I want to trust you more. I pray it in your precious name. Amen. I don't know um, if you ever have had the thought before today that there's a God who runs and he, he does run. He runs to the repentant. And I'm going to encourage you to take out your phone, your smartphone, to look up the online connection card on our website or the app and uh, communicate with us. Lord, we, I pray that, that people would communicate with us how this message has spoken to your heart. Please, um, as Alex sings this song, and then we'll be, be done. Alex.
Do you believe that's our God? He loves us that much. Um, would y'all stand? He wants to lavish his love, his riches upon us. Riches of forgiveness and grace and things we can't even imagine. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, for those who repent and come to him. Listen to this verse, and I'll close with this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor all the way to the cross, so that you and me, through his poverty, might become rich. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great day. I love you guys.